Today is a special day. Today is a day that we ordain two men um, and their families into the ministry. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. And I thought it very pointed to, 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 to speak a message directly to them and give you all an opportunity to lean in and to hear um, what's not just for them, but, just, but for you as well. Um, have you ever had a conversation that you wish you could have just been a fly on the wall and heard, right? I think of the meeting between uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. I wish we could have had audio from that meeting. I believe that Dr. Martin Luther King was preaching the gospel to Malcolm X. I, I just, I, in, in my imagination, that is what I could imagine. Could you just imagine if we could be, and some of us are deviant in this, we wish we could have an audio recording of what's happening in the Oval Office in the White House so that we could find conspiracy and, 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 and know more information. But we live in a world, don't we, where people want to be in the know. They want news. They want to hear what is happening uh, around them. And so often we miss what is happening in us. That there's a call. There's a calling on our life. I want you to write this down. This is extra. I want you to know there are four callings. There's four of them. There's the upper call. There's the, the rather the higher call, the lower call, the inner call, and the outer call. There's the higher call, the lower call, the inner call, and the outer call. You have this inner call. The inner call is our own desires. It's the things that are calling out to us from within. It's it's the, the, the nature that exists within us, this selfish, this self-seeking desire that every single one of us have. Listen, let's be honest today. We all have an inner call. We all have something on the inside of us that's calling to us, that's telling us, just like the plant in Little Shop of Horrors, feed me, Seymour. There's something that's calling out to us saying, feed me, give me what it is that I long for. We have the outer call. We all have uh, 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 in influences. We have spheres of influence. We have people who are around us and they're calling out to us, friends that are calling out to us, careers that are calling out to us, the news, the media, the government that's calling out to us. Every single one of us, I'm convinced we have an FBI agent assigned to us and they work in our Facebook page and everything that we even think about, they they put in our Facebook news feed, and they call out to us. The other day, I was, t I was, we were sh my wife and I, we were talking about buying a new mattress. We wanted, we were looking at a new mattress, and so I'm in my Facebook feed, and purple mattress, and 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 all of these mattress, posturepedic mattress, and all these mattresses are showing up in my eyes. I said, somebody has got to be listening to me. And here's another thing: I have this tendency when it comes to YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube, and the thing I hate about YouTube is the ads. Right, and you can pay to remove the ads, but um, they're not going to get any of my money, right? So, I just don't really care for the ads, and I have this tendency when the ads come, I wait the four to five seconds, and what do you do? You hit skip, right? And so, well, I had my phone playing YouTube, and and I was I was you know getting ready, and and I wasn't near the phone, and I thought these YouTube people they know the proximity of to, of my phone to me, and so instead of waiting to put the ads at the end of the video that I was watching, they put it right in the middle, and I couldn't because of what I was doing, I couldn't get to the phone to hit skip, and I had to endure the weight, the bondage, the struggle of an advertisement about a, a minute and fifty second advert. And I said, man, if I, you just you put those ads on there because you know I'm not close to my phone and I can't hit that skip button. But there's an outer call, right? There's every single one of us have external influences that are calling out to us, things that want our attention, things that want our time, things that want our energy, things that want our effort. And then we have a lower call. Let me help you understand something. There are things that are calling out to you that are designed to take you from the high place where God has set you and bring you into a pit, bring you into a lower place. There's a, there's a pit that's calling out to every single one of us. There's this, 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 this lowering of ourselves. This this come down from where God has placed us. There's this, there's this enemy, this adversary, specifically Satan, who is calling out, who is calling us. Listen, just because you're saved doesn't mean that Satan doesn't come and doesn't try and talk to you. Matter of fact, Satan, if he's willing to talk to Jesus in the wilderness and all that Jesus was able to do, he'll certainly come and talk to you and to me. But then there's this higher calling. There is this Samuel 
calling. There is this Moses calling. There is this heavenly calling. There is this desire of higher things, and that is specifically God who's calling you to partner with him, who's calling you to journey with him, who's calling you to live your life in a way that manifests him, who's calling you to serve him, who's calling out to you. And there's a God that in this text we see this higher calling that is made specifically to the people of God. While it is, yes, it is incumbent in the pastorate. It is encompassed in the ministry that we've been called to. God is calling every single one of us to be broadcasters, to be antennas, to be people who will stand on the rooftop and shout aloud of the good news of God, of the grace of God, of the mercy of God, of the compassion of God, of the salvation of God, of the renewal of God, of the hope of God, of the healing of God. There's a higher calling that every single person has and your unique gifting and your unique your unique experience are designed to help you to be a megaphone, a megaphoneo that cries aloud to the world that there's only hope in Jesus. You see, there's not hope in government. Medicare can't heal you. Jesus can. The government cannot provide for you. Jesus can. I'm submitting to you that there's a higher calling. And so I want you to lean in as I speak to, to, to these men and to their wives as God has engaged with them in a higher calling. And the first thing I want you to write down is, is something somewhat counterintuitive. I'm going to get comfortable this morning. It's counterintuitive. Write this down. Write down. Get to the top of it. Get to the top of it. Now, you're, you, many of you are going, wait a minute. No, the saying is get to the bottom of it, right? That's the concept. Whenever there's a problem, whenever there's a challenge, whenever there's a difficulty, we want to get to the bottom of it. I, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm guilty. Whenever there seems like there's something that's gone astray, something that's gone awry, I become an investigator. Don't you? When something seems off, we begin to put on our inspector gadget hat and our single bi our, our, our bifocal, and we begin to inspect. We become master detectives, and we want to get to the bottom of it. Let me help you understand that the Word of God is countercultural. It's counterintuitive. What happens is when things don't go the way that we think they should go, we start digging down to the bottom. And I'm submitting to you that the solution to the problem is not in the pit. The solution to the problem is at the mountaintop. Don't, let me help you get this. The text that you're reading in Romans chapter number 10, it is the text that is echoed by the Apostle Paul, and this was written by Isaiah. He is echoing the same words. He is repeating the same words that Isaiah is, is saying. And what he's saying is that blessed are the people. Blessed are the... He, he uses the term Isaiah. He says, blessed is Zion. Anybody know what Zion is? Zion is a body of people. It is, a, it is a reference to a mountain in Jerusalem. And so here's what I want you to do when you look at Romans chapter 10. I want you to juxtapose these concepts in the Bible. We're going to create a picture collage. And the first picture is Moses on the mountaintop. The next picture is Elijah in the cleft of the rock. And then the next picture is Jesus on the Mount, on Mount Olive with the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. And then we get to Romans chapter number 10. And so let me help you understand, when God is calling you, he's not calling you to a people, he's calling you to himself. He's calling you to come into partnership with him. He's not calling to send you out. He's calling so that you'll go with him. As a matter of fact, God often says to those he calls, I, the Lord, go before you. I have this prevenient grace. I'm already where you are, and I'm calling you to me. Let me give you this picture. Moses, and let me help you get this. The Bible says that many are called, but few chosen. Let me help you understand what that means. The chosen are the ones who answer the call. The call is disseminated to everyone. Every single person 
is being called. So let me help you get this, right? Let, let's build a, a basketball team, right? If you go and you look at the NBA, professional, professional sports, they build teams, and there's a limit to the number of people who can be on their team, right? The Golden State Warriors, right? Best team in the, in the NBA. Praise God. Hallelujah. They just won last night, game one. Praise God. Amen. There's a limit of the number on their team, and it's 15. There are a limit to the number of people who make it into the NBA. There's a limit to the number of spots available on college teams, collegiate teams. There's a limit to the number of of jobs available in the marketplace. There's a limit. Listen, as big as Walmart is, they have a limit to the number of jobs that they're able to produce, they're able to provide. And I'm submitting to you what's countercultural is that God has no limit. God is not limiting who's able to become a part of the kingdom. There's room for you. There's room for your gifting. There's room for your ability. There's a space for you. It doesn't matter what your resume looks like. Your employer cares what your resume looks like. God doesn't care about your resume. If you don't believe me, go and talk to Abraham and Isaac. Go and talk to Jacob. Go and talk to David and Daniel. Go and talk to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Go and talk to Obadiah. Go and talk to Jonah. Go and talk to Mike. Go and talk to Nahum. Go and talk to Habakkuk. Go and talk to John the Baptist. Go and talk to to Zephaniah. Go and talk to Zechariah. Go and talk to Solomon and David. Go and talk to to Jehoshaphat. None of them had perfect resumes. None of them was good enough, but God still had a place and a purpose and a plan for them. And so let me help you get this. It doesn't matter how young or how old. You think, well, I'm too old. Go and talk to Caleb and Joshua. They were 80. Your youth, your, your age, you say, well, I'm too young. Go and talk to King Jehu. I'm submitting to you that God has a place for you, regardless of your background, regardless of your calling, regardless of your resume, that there's a call for you. And God chooses, he doesn't limit, he chooses every single person who says, here am I, Lord, send me. Those are the chosen. And so what God is trying to get you to see is, so, so, so let, me, let, me, let me help you see it. What happens is, think the wilderness. There's a multitude of people who are only going to gather around the bottom of the mountain because of their fear, because of their misunderstanding, because of their heritage, because of their experiences in life. There is a larger multitude of people who are going to come and see what's going on, but they're never going to enter into the beauty of the holiness of God. And so I'm submitting to you That instead of standing at the base of the mountain, instead of being among the people who are too afraid or too ill-equipped or too unprepared, that you have this opportunity to not get to the church, to not get to the pastor, but to get to the mountaintop. It is is, uh, Martin Luther King who said, I have been to the mountaintop. And you see, the mountaintop is what gives you the perspective that everybody else cannot see. They can see the, you can see the course where they think that there is no way. You see God's way. And here's what happens. When you get to the mountaintop, you don't experience the people. You experience the beauty of the holiness of God. You experience his divine presence and you experience his touch. You experience his unique nature. You experience his comfort. He reminds you that I did call you, that I am with you, that I will protect you, that I will provide for you. And then... When you've been to the mountaintop and you come back down among the people, there's this glowing aura. There's this anointing. There's this mark that you've been in the presence of God. And that's what makes people want to go where you're going because they see God in your life. You don't believe me? Remember Naomi? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay with where you move. I'll move. I will follow. She wasn't talking to her mother-in-law. She was talking to the one who was at the top of the mountain. And she's saying, God, whatever you do, I'll do. Wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you stay, I'll stay. Wherever you move, I'll move. I'll follow you. You see, there's a higher calling. Moses heard that calling. Samuel heard that calling. And it was Samuel who would ultimately be used 
to take that anointing and pour it out on the king that God had chosen. I'm submitting to you that God is calling you into partnership, into unison with him so that you can experience his nature, so that you can feel his power, so that you can feel his anointing. And so that that anointing, when you become full of what God has for you, you can then come and pour it out on people. You see, here's, here's what happens on the mountain. What happens on the mountain is as the people behold from the base of the mountain, there's something happening. There's fire that's coming down on the mountain. And what's going up? There's smoke going up. This is a visual picture. What the people need to see isn't us. The people need to see the fire from heaven. The people need to see the anointing of God. The people need to see God's ability to heal, God's ability to restore, God's ability to renew, God's ability to revive, God's ability to take what's broken and put it back together. And what he puts back together looks better than what it was before it got broken. They need to see the unique touch of God. They need to see the fire that falls from heaven into your life. And then what they need to see is the smoke of your praise the smoke of your adoration, the smoke of every glory, hallelujah, the smoke of every hosanna in the highest, the smoke of every glory be to the most high God in your life. They need to see how big God is and how good God is. They need to hear every sacrifice of praise. We need to open up our mouth and let it be known that there is a God in heaven. We need to shout it from the mountaintop that there is a God who's able to deliver. Get to the top of it. You're going through difficult times. Get to, don't get to the bottom of it. Get to the top of it. Yes. Your family's falling apart. Stop trying to get to the bottom of it. Get to the mountaintop with God. You're worrying about your finances. Stop trying to get to the bottom of it. Get to the mountaintop with God. You're worrying about your marriage. You're worrying about your children. Stop worrying. Stop trying to get to the bottom of it. Get to the mountaintop. Get into the presence of God. Get his perspective. Get his anointing. And when you come back among your family within your marriage down to the bank, you don't go down with your power. You go down with God's anointing. Get to the top of it. When Elijah was running for his life, he didn't run to a pit. He ran to the cleft of the rock. He ran to the same place that Moses experienced the glow and the glory of God. And it, watch this. It was God who didn't speak in the storm, in the fire, in the loudness. It was God who spoke in a still, small voice. And watch this. After Elijah is comforted, what does he do? He goes to a city where there's a widow woman and he brings with him the anointing he got from heaven and he causes her son who's dead to rise again. You cannot do it in your own power. The disciples said it. They said, we saw you cast out devils. Why can't we? And he said, because some of it is prayer and fasting. Let me give you the synopsis. What he's saying is some of this stuff has to be done by you getting to the mountaintop, getting in the presence of God, accessing his power. Then you'll see healing. Then you'll see clarity. Then you'll see deliverance. Then you'll see resurrection. Then you'll see power. Then you'll see anointing. Stop trying to get to the bottom of everything. Satan wants you on the bottom. But God is calling you up higher. He's calling you to the top. Get to the top of it. Jesus in his most difficult time, goes to Mount Olivet. And it is there that he speaks with Moses. And I believe the second figure, Elijah. I believe he's speaking to heaven's host. He's speaking to God the Father. You see, it is God who says, hey, uh, Moses, get up. Elijah, get up. All right, we're finna go and talk to Jesus. Let's go talk to him because he's got a tough road ahead. He's got to die for the sins of all of the world. He's got to die for your sins. He's going to die for the sins of the people of God and the sins for the Gentiles. He's got this huge task on his shoulders. He's got to deal with the weight of everybody's sin. Listen, if we look in the mirror, we have enough sin of our own. 
Jesus dies not only for my sin, but for the sins of the entire world. No wonder he is in the garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood because of the weight and the burden of the cup that is handed to him. I'm submitting to you that when God has a plan for you and a purpose for you, don't try to get to the bottom of it. Get to the top of it. Get to the mountaintop. Get to the place. Now watch this. Here's why it's a mountaintop. Because everybody can't handle the oxygen levels at higher altitudes. Let me help you understand something in ministry. There are always, and life, so lean in. This is going to help you. There are always people who try to get next to you. You know why? Because there's an anointing in your life. They, wanna, they want to withdraw. They want to extract. They want to be able to handle what it is that God has put in you. And it's because they haven't realized that there's a God in heaven who will give them that same anointing, who will give them that same blessing. Who, so you don't have to come to me to get what God has for you. You can go directly to God. But here, because I cannot see God, it's easy for me to come to the one that I can see and try to withdraw and extract from the one that I can see rather than going to the one that I can't. And so the reason why God brings you up that journey to the top of the mountain is because here's what you'll find out, that the people who were comfortable at the base of the mountain, they'll leave you at the higher levels of the mountain. And your crowd will begin to thin because people can't cannot handle the higher altitude. You see, what happens is people at the base of the mountain, let, let, me, let me give you this picture. What did they do when Moses ascended the mountain? They said, you've been up for 40 days, here's what we're going to do. God's done with this. Let's make, watch this, God, we, we can't get God to stay down here with us, so we're going to make our own God. Right? The truth of the matter is, as you do what God calls you to do, you say, man, I got these friends, and I'm really just trying to get rid of all of these friends. Get closer to God. Amen. And what they'll do is they'll go, <gasps> and what we try to do is we try to give them the bag that falls from the, from the, from the airplane when the altitude drops. We try to say, hey, breathe this, breathe this, because we want people to stay with us. We want people to stick around. But the truth of the matter is that God is causing the elevation to go higher. He's causing the oxygen to be depleted because he's trying to weed out the people. And he's trying to get you to see that, listen, it's not in your strength. It's not in your might. It's not what's in you. It's in God. And you need him. And so get to the mountaintop and get from God. Let God cause you to reach up to him and draw from the energy, draw from the oxygen that he offers to those who find themselves on the mountaintop. See what God sees so that you can lead where God leads. So not only do you need to get to the top of it, here's my second point and we'll be done. I want you to get to the top of it, but I want you to, rem to remember this. Bring blessings. We live in a culture of people who are consumers. They're takers. And what happens is when we, when we live in a world of consumption, what we tend to do is we say we withhold what's ours. I'm going to keep what's mine. Let me help you understand something, right? Listen, j just, just live your life for the rest of the week. You'll find there's a whole bunch of people trying to get your money. <laughs> buy now. Buy this. Walmart. Buy it. Don't Buy one, get one. <laughs> right? BOGO, get you a BOGO, come on, buy one, get one, right? Buy it now, buy it now, buy it now. We got this special offer, and if you don't click buy now, it's going to be more expensive when you try to come back and get this product, right? It's going to be double the price, it's going to be triple the price, so you got to buy now, buy now, buy now. There's always someone that's trying to get your stuff. I'm submitting to you that what it does is it causes us to be stingy. When you come to the place where you realize what you have isn't yours, you give it to who God tells you to give it to. You do with it what God tells you to do with it. 
You want to know why, why we give in church? It's practice. It's, it's helping us, a body in motion stays in motion. It's practice that helps us to be generous. So when you see that person on the street that's less fortunate to you, oh, it was easy for me to give in church, and now it's easy for me to be a blessing to somebody else. When you see that person who's going through a difficult time, it becomes easy for you to be a blessing to that person. There are people who are grieving. When you learn how to give, you'll learn how to give comfort to those who are grieving. When you're dealing with people who are wayward and who are obstinate and who are unwilling to move for God, you're able to give them a word of exhortation and a word of motivation and a word of truth because you're constantly giving. And so the purpose of you getting to the mountaintop is not so that you can keep what God shows you for yourself. The purpose of you going to the top of it, getting to the mountaintop, is so that you can give to the people of God what God wants for them. And so there's, there's three blessings that you're supposed to bring, and it's here in the text. You thought it was about money. Hey, about money. Here's, here's, here's what I want you to bring. Here's the blessings you give to people. You bring them glad tidings. You bring them good news. You know what people really need? You know what's more important than money? Good news. You see, some people are stuck because they're focusing on their difficulty. The truth of the matter, let me help you understand something, that God is a way maker and God is a miracle worker and God is Jehovah Jireh. He's a provider. So if your resources are limited, here's the truth of the matter. We serve a God in heaven who owns, the Bible says, the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And so if you have limited resources, there's a God in heaven who has unlimited resources, and he is so powerful that he's able to create something where there is nothing so that he can provide for his people. He's the God that's able to bring water out of a stone. He's the God that's able to make manna rain from heaven. Anybody ever seen bread fall from heaven? He's the kind of God who's able to do the impossible. And so when we come to people, we bring them good news. That even in the midst of turmoil and chaos, there's a savior, there's a redeemer, there's hope, there's a future, there's a deliverer who's going to deal with all of this adversity. Bring them good tidings. Bring them also good things. We ought to be willing to take of our resources and bless people. You know what what gets you off of yourself when you give to others? You know, there's so many of us who can focus on our hurts and our pains and our struggles. The truth of the matter is, when we focus on what God has for others, we lose ourselves in giving and serving other people. And then lastly, bring them not only good things, but bring them great joy. You see, the Christmas story, the shepherds, the angels that came to them said, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. We live in a world filled with sorrow, don't we? Filled with hurts, filled with pain, filled with loss. I'm coming to you today to tell you that heaven's message is that there's great joy. And you know what the joy is? That in the midst of challenges, there's victory. In the midst of tragedy, there's triumph. In the midst of difficult times, in the midst of valleys low, in the midst of hurts and failures, in the midst of fears, there's a God who prepares a table for you. There's a God who calls you up higher into his presence. There's a God who delivers you. There's a God who's able to do above, exceeding, the Bible says, above all that you could ever ask or think. And so what we're bringing is great joy. And here is the greatest joy of them all. Don't miss it in the text. The greatest joy in Romans chapter 10 is not all of the stuff. It's when a sinner comes to Jesus and gets saved. The quandary is, if there's this solution to the brokenness of humanity, how then shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how then shall they hear if there is no preacher? And how then shall there be a preacher if there's no one sent? I believe that the church at Rome was standing up and saying, just like Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. There's a, a hymn, and I want to, I just want to, just, the, it, here's, here's the chorus. Send the light, 
the blessed gospel light. Send it now from, from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. There's this song that's saying what people need is the light. What people need is the gospel. And if God's going to send the gospel, he's going to appoint a person to proclaim the gospel and he's going to send them. He's going to send you and you and you to carry the message of hope that there's salvation in none other except Jesus Christ. So get to the top of it. And then when you've experienced God's divine nature, when you come down off the mountain, don't try to keep the anointing for yourself, but be a blessing and give to who God tells you to give.